town where the gigs I had was playing in the house band with the Cotton Club. Mm. And he, and back then, they used to put cats for like two week runs, and he, he came in and did two weeks. He had a band, his band was called Joe Frazier and the Knockouts. <laughs> and you know, he originally were, actually had Junior Mance's trio back then when he was working in Las Vegas, but I guess gradually he started working, you know, smaller venues. But we, he was up there for two weeks, and I'll never forget, he was, one night Muhammad Ali came in. Oh, and he was in the heat of air. Well, it was, Joe was Joe was seeing my way, you know. And he would, he had to fight with him. And now the end is there, and to our face the final knockout. <laughs> you know, like, he, was, you know, he would do stuff like that. <laughs> so he's singing, and Ali gets up and he goes, "Oh man, quick, Joe, that one hurts worse. Hurts worse than the one you got me with in the third round in Manila." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had the whole place like in stitches. <laughs> and the more would do that as Joe would start singing, he'd start doing that thing that he would do yeah. that thing. He'd be doing this with the microphone. <laughs> it was it was funny, man. Yeah. That's he was, something though. He was he was a very nice man. So, so, so how did that come about? The Joe Frazier project? Well at the, I got to play in the house band at the conference the uh, Ed Alan Ed Pizant had the band it was called the Pizant Brothers. Mm. And my friend Rusty Cloud was a keyboard player and he recommended me and he liked me and, and Joe like because I would play like, you know, that's why I played a lot of electric guitar. Mm-hmm. I'd play like boozy kind of like riffs around that, but what he would say. Right, right, right. Rusty played like a real strong kind of like, you know, like uh, piano. And so he, you know, could kind of like almost play like a horn player and stay out of the way and play lines. Yeah, and just trying to step on anybody's toes. And he would, he would dig it. He would dig every now and then. He would say, man, it's a guitar player. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, you know, I ended up doing it for a couple of weeks. He was there. Mm-hmm. It was funny. He was, I mean, he was a really nice guy. And the people that knew him and worked with him really liked him. Mm. And then with uh, Jim Klaus uh, and Rusty went to his funeral and Phil passed away. He was a sweet man. I mean, that's the thing, you know, you just see this big bruiser guy and you don't realize that human beings, you want it. Everybody wants to be judged as an individual. No, nobody wants to be like, you know, oh, you belong to that group, therefore you must be like everybody else in that group, as if everybody in any group is the same. Mm. You know, so it's, you know, it, it's interesting to, to watch. You know, when Dad was turned 92, it's interesting to watch how he changed over that time period. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been fortunate to be a musician all my life. Four of really remarkable human beings have taught me that, mm. you know, di- directly. Mm. You know, I have no reason to like you. You're a guitar player, a piano player, man, because you're going to get this way up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, play with somebody like Harold Neighbor. And no better musician walk, has ever walked the face of the earth, and no more accommodating than you've been. You know, I mean, I did play tunes, I didn't even know, but he, he could tell right away you didn't know. So he voiced the chords, so the first time to be tuning, it was like he was teaching you the tune. Now you know the tune, now, now we can play. Mm. And he would do it without the audience even noticing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just, you know, remarkable guys like that, you know. Just, you know, you just, it's, it's, that's the thing about how great and how powerful the music is. Or, you know, people, I, I don't think people understand how deep the music is, because they quite naturally, have been taught to have their attention, you know, be attracted to something else. And let's face it, Lady Gaga is running around in a meat suit, second with a microphone that looks like a dildo. It's like, you know, to ask somebody that's seen that for the first time to be paying attention to what's going on between the bass drum and the bass player. You know, I mean, they have to have their attention diverted to, to, to the not obvious. They may feel that. But to actually listen to it and have that be, or paying attention to the way the chords are being voiced, so I mean that's just not a nat- natural thing to go to. Right. The natural thing to go to is the spectacle. Right. So you think that people nowadays that listen to music, they have a shorter attention span, they need like a bigger show to really actually stay focused. And I think, I think you're saying that the nuances, the little, the little details that really make music so beautiful, are kind of lost. Well, I, it's not that they're lost. It's just that a lot of people don't hear them or don't or don't sense them because their attention is different. So yes, I mean the, the classic, uh, you know, technique of any magician is if I'm going to like do something that makes something disappear with my left hand, I need to do something that attracts your attention to my right hand. Because right. if you follow my left hand, you're going to know that I, it wasn't really magic. It was it was just a sleight of hand. Right. And I think that you know because we've had several generations that have been raised with music being something that you watch. I mean, how infrequently, you know, do you hear somebody say, I want to hear somebody play last night. You say, I want to see a show. I want to see this band. Mm. I want to see this performer. I want to see Bruce Springsteen. 
not only to hear, you know, uh, 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 Joshua Redman or something. You know, it's like you don't, you, it's just a different perspective. Mm. And I think that that had, tells part of the tale, even though it's you know just like a slip of the tongue or a common usage of the language. I think it says something about people's frame of reference. And I think you can even take that a step further. Uh, I like to, to play this little game with folks where I'll ask them, you know, do you think that music can communicate something that words cannot communicate? You know, like clear, concrete ideas and things. And most of them will either say yes or they'll qualify their affirmative answer by saying, well, it communicates emotions or moods. And I'm saying, well, okay, whatever you think that it can communicate that, you know, that words cannot communicate, uh, wouldn't you acknowledge that that repertoire of things that are unique to music would be best exemplified by instrumental music, as opposed to music that's attached to lyrics or words. And most of them, like, haven't ever really thought of it that way. And then once I can get to that stage, I'll say, all right, what percentage of your music collection is instrumental music? Most, for most people, it's a very small percentage. So they're not familiar with the notion of, you know, musical development of ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people want to say, you know, I can't get a clearer example of an idea than blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, those two little thirds are like the, the, the genome of that symphony. Everything in the rest of the symphony oh, yeah, comes out. And not only that, it's totally identifiable, but it comes out of the replication of that. You know, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
would it enlighten your life of Moses or Jesus or something that was an unbelievably most profound thing that anybody will ever say to you in the history or of the world or your entire life. And right as they were getting ready to do it, the fire department broke and said the building was burning down and that there was a terrorist alert to block, the building was going to blow up. Your attention would quite naturally be diverted into that other thing. And you may even run out of the apartment without the scroll that we were brought in. Right, right, right. That's kind of what I mean. And I think so yeah. much of what, what's going on is about uh, attracting your attention to things that have every right to exist and are interesting. They just should not exist at the expense of all this other stuff. And, and inc increasingly, because time is the commodity that we have the least amount of, right, right, right. people make their choices based on what is easy. America's got a long history of choosing convenience over quality. Mm. They didn't. McDonald's would not have ever become the most you know, successful restaurant in the history of the world. I remember when McDonald's started. I was, uh, you know, a kid, and the burgers were 15 cents. I remember my grandfather saying, "You're not really going to eat that." Are you? I was a kid. He was like, "You're standing in line. Yeah, we're going to get 15 cent burgers, man. That's really right. cool." Yeah, yeah. But you know, when you're that young, what do you know? I just am concerned when I see people that are, you know, 50 years old that will spend $800 on a 1990 Chateau Margot and listen to Led Zeppelin while they're drinking. Not this even wrong with Led Zeppelin. Right, right. But it's like, if you could develop your sensibility to appreciate yeah, Chateau yeah. Margot 1990 and, and would be willing to spend $800 on it. That demands its own, you know, yeah. it needs it for, for anything. Why can't you, you know? read Proust or listen or to Brahms? Food or music or... You know, really, even just speaking to somebody, you really should be able to give it your full attention. Sure, sure. You know, but I also like think to totally your full attention. But I think music plays this sociological role in our evolution. You know, because we, most of us, I mean, it may be dramatically different now, but most of the, you know, last probably 20 or 30 generations, music plays this role in their adolescence in forming who they are because. Most people don't go out into the world and completely reinvent themselves. They kind of look around and choose from the things that are around them. It's like, yeah, well, you know, like, you know, I like Budweiser, so I ask like Coors. You know, I wear Reebok, she wear Nike. Somebody, one person drives a Toyota, somebody else drives a Ford. You know, we tend to like choose.